I'd like you to meet my very very special guests Anita and Don. What do you think are the most difficult years in a marriage? I would say the beginning few years. The first 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> Life is never easy. Two people come together as partners. There will be problems. It's a wonderful companionship traveling that road together. Depends upon how you as a unit overcome. Building complete transparency with your partner is very important. In a corporate world, you'll do it. Why not in marriage? Today's generation is bad. Why would you say that? They don't respect elders. We have to be role models to our children. I happened to shoot down one Pakistani aircraft. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the show that is all heart and today really truly we are going to be talking about all the matters of the heart. I'd like you to meet my very very special guests on the show today, Anita and Don. Welcome. Hey, Thank you. Karish. Hey, Karish. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for doing this. Uh, it means a lot to both Chandran and me and uh, obviously we we'll, can't wait to get out and have dinner with you in a bit. <laughs> But it's a privilege to be here this evening. Yeah. Thank you for inviting us. Pleasure. Now, um, I know both of you, Anita and Dawn, through Chandran. Uh, Chandran's very dear friend, Mark, and him, they've known each other for more than 25 years now, and you are Mark's parents. Uh, I know, Anita, you have been a counsellor for over 30 years. You've been working with couples on relationships. And uh, Dawn, you are group captain. Dawn Lazarus retired from the Indian Air Force. That is so cool. And we have to get to that cool quotient in a bit. But I think what's even cooler is that you decided to, you know, get on board with uh, Anita's mission and vision. And you've together been counseling uh, for 20 of those 30 years. Yes, yes, indeed. It's been a wonderful thing. Wonderful journey for uh, me, especially because uh, she is the stabilizing factor. How many years since you've been married? Good question. Have a guess. Have a guess. Have a guess. Uh, shall I? Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm going to say, I think my, this is, I'm going to do this based on what Mark's age. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think Mark must be around 47-ish. And then you must be at least 50 years married. Yes. Minimum. You're right. And, but. This year, December, we celebrate our 50th. <gasps> This calls for a big celebration. Can I ask you a question? Yes. What do you think are the most difficult years in a marriage? I would say the beginning few years. The first 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> Anita, do you agree on this? Yeah, and and keeping on going, following 50. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it's so a wonderful hard. thing. It's not that hard, but it's a question of building up, building up. Life is never easy. There will be problems. And then it depends upon how you as a unit overcome. That's what we have learned. And we are two strong characters. So it's not very submissive on either side. So you're often at loggerheads. Yeah. You know who's right? Well, I'm guessing uh, the missus. <laughs> <laughs> you're absolutely right. <laughs> Always. That was a okay. good answer. Conceded since I'm, you know, outnumbered, outnumbered over here. This <laughs> Was there any possible other right answer to that question, Don? I'll hold my breath. <laughs> <laughs> There's a wise man. All right. What we want to talk about uh, today is largely uh, something that's very close to my heart, which is um, relationships. I've recently met a whole lot of single parents, um, you know, through something that Chandran and I are doing together. We have created a single parent support group and uh, we've seen that there's there's just so many marriages that didn't make it and it breaks my heart outside of that group as well in life in general whether it's work you know anywhere you go you travel to there's stories of relationships not working out I thought perhaps um, you know wisdom of the ages is probably the need of the hour so Anita if I can ask you in your experience um, you know if you can share with us some of the most common reasons um, that relationships don't work out? The first I'd say is that uh, it is selfishness, a self-focus. Two people come together as partners and it's a, it's a wonderful um, companionship traveling that road together. It's, it's, it's a privilege, you know, where you get 
uh, good companions to travel. But when one is selfish and completely focused on their needs and forget about the other one, then it's destructive. The second thing I would say is that when um, you are friendly with somebody, you are so attentive and, you know, wanting to learn about that person, wanting to discover things and wanting to, um, you know, uh, draw on that learning and in relationships. But uh, as soon as people get married, they kind of give up. Okay, now I'm married, let's get on with our lives kind mm -hmm. of thing. So the lack of attention and appreciation, that's mm -hmm. the second one I would say. And the third one is sometimes uh, a lack of uh, the flexibility and the willingness to forgive because we are not perfect. No two perfect people will make it in a marriage, I can tell you that. <laughs> but uh, when someone makes a mistake, the other one is not often not willing to forgive, to make capital out of that, and that's very destructive. So I would say these three things. I have a different Don't. opinion in that sense. Uh, I, when we are single, we are I, me, myself. And that concept is carried through in marriage. Mm. That has to change. Until the realization comes that it's not I, but it is we, the problem will be there. Many, many couples think of themselves. Even today, we find that there are selfish people. However, you know, long they may be married, they haven't yet. They have different bank accounts. They have different, obviously, families. They never gel together. The aim is to become one. The two become one. We take vows, etc., etc. You know, you burn two candles, you have one candle. All that thing is done. But when it comes to reality, because there is the ego in the person, and that ego is very strong. When one realizes that I am a nobody and this is a partner of mine, then I change and change starts. That's the crux of my understanding of relationships, why they are having problems. And today, you know, women are independent since the movement started about liberation, etc. Good, no, 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 no doubt about it. But uh, that thing has to change. That must come into, we are in it together. The moment that starts, okay, the change will come in and the marriage changes. The moment you understand that in any, you know, uh, problems that you have, you come, okay, let me put us together in this. That's the thing in my understanding. In the years that you've been doing this for, in the 30 years, and you've done this in multiple countries with multiple, you know, different uh, people from different nationalities, different religious beliefs, all of that. Um, would you say that over time, people's commitment to working it out has changed? I would agree with that completely because, you know, I'll tell you the story of a couple in the US who uh, we were asked to talk to. She's American doesn't know a word of Hindi. He's Gujarati, doesn't know a word of English. Oh. And they met in a camp, uh, Youth for Christ or something. And they came together, they got married, believing that word that this is the guy for me, this is a girl for me. And then they had big problems because apart from communication, he would sit back and expect hot chapatis. And she would expect him to help with the dishes. I mean, this is a very small example. Yeah. But there was a clash of cultures there, yeah. a clash of understanding. And without language, they had a very difficult time trying to work it out. So, yeah, the, I think over these years, I have seen uh, a fall in the desire to be committed. It's much easier to opt out, to say, look, I've tried. It's okay. I'll go my way. You go your way. So... Um, I don't know. I keep thinking about our generation and thinking uh, up till that generation when you uh, you got married and you worked it out. There was no exit clause. Hmm? Now there are exit clauses, so it makes it easier. But uh, having said that, I would say that the the commitment, the long term commitment, actually makes for a very rich uh, relationship, which you are missing something when you keep like a tea taster just tasting the tea and spitting it out and going somewhere else and tasting again, you're missing the depth and the flavor and the intensity of the relationship. That uh, So it's not an obligation. It is a choice. But it's the way you work that choice out. From a lot of experiences that I've heard shared, 
um, that come from women who decided to opt out. Um, a lot of times um, they seem to be saying that the other person hadn't grown up yet, hadn't gone from being a boy to a man yet. So wasn't shouldering financial responsibilities or any other kind of responsibilities. Can situations like these be remedied? Yes, of course. You have to walk with the person to showing everyone has a desire to reach a higher level from where they are. If you can touch that place, then uh, to more greater maturity, especially when a boy gets married and, uh, you know, he's under the thumb of his mother and the poor wife is sidelined and um, he, she's not given the importance that she deserves as somebody standing next to him. So we worked with a couple like that who, you know, he, his mother was um, a single mother and uh, she was a principal, very capable, and she... Um, uh, chose this girl, also from an armed forces background, for this man and said, you get married to her and then I will be queen. But it didn't work because the girl was not willing to do to share that place. And in the end, she said, um, I'm going back to my parents with this son of mine. And I asked the husband, what do you want to do? He said, I'll stay with my mother. So I told him, what's wrong with you? You know, so the clarity, the, the sometimes it's just things that have not been thought through, mm. that have not been, uh, culture creates certain expectations, mm. you know, that you honor the mother. You can honor the mother. You don't dishonor her, but you have to make place for the wife also. You have two sons. Yeah. So this hits home, I'm sure. Don, what's your opinion? Trust has to be built up between the two. I'll share a personal situation in our lives, what happened. After I took early retirement from the Air Force, I got some dividends back. And also, we invested a certain amount in a place called Coimbatore. It's about 60 kilometers from where we stay. And that investment was maturing. So we sat down and decided what is to be done. And uh, we said, okay, don't reinvest. Bring it back. We need it for something else. So with that understanding, I went down to Coimbatore. And uh, in them days, we didn't have mobile phones or anything of that sort. And when I went to that fellow, he said, sir, you invested for one more year. The dividends will be much better. Mm. So I, being the head of the family, I took a decision. <laughs> I said, kar do. <laughs> hmm? And I was very happy. And I said, you know, a year later, we'll get better dividends. So when I came back and I told her, she got angry with me. She said, how dare you do it? I said, what do you mean? I said, you've got no clue of finances. Then I thought, I betrayed her trust. I went with the intention of the decision we had taken together. Yeah. I betrayed that. I withdrew from that. Mm. And ever since, she had then trusted me for finances. Mm -hmm. You see, because I gave her the respect and honor to tell her that I honor the decision we make together. Yeah. And I am responsible to ensure that it is done that way. Yes. If I have made a mistake, I'm sorry, I'll correct for it. Though I lost out financially, she doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> he came back with this suitcase. Again. Anything that is concerned with finance, she trusts me. Mm. That is what is required. Yeah. You know, you have to build up and that was not, uh, you know, uh, intentionally done by me. It was done for the benefit of our family. Yes. But it turned out that way. Yes. Her understanding. I have to respect that. I think that is a very important issue, uh, Karishma. You know, joint decision making. You've grown up as two individuals. You come together. You have to learn how to make joint decisions. In a corporate world, you'll do it, you know. So it, why not in marriage? Your desires are so strong, you tend to be motivated by them rather than wait. It requires waiting and patience, lots of patience. <laughs> there was a couple that came to us. The wife was complaining. He's saying, my husband gives me money to, you know, run the home. And can you imagine, Don? He asks me how much money I spent on buying chilies. Can you imagine? Ghar mein chili khridne ke liye, he wants me to give an account. Then we had to explain to them that how to manage finances. How to make joint decisions joint about decisions. finance. Some you are responsible, some we are responsible together, some he is responsible. Then there was some semblance in their finance handling. 
people are not aware what is the emotional gain from working out things like these um could you explain that see the important factor is that we work together that we decide together and then when we go our own way to implement we must make sure that that decision is implemented if we don't then the other person gets very upset also that building trust building a vulnerability building complete transparency with your partner is very important mm. and uh, if you can do that through the decision making through whatever area you're looking at you've gained a friend you gain somebody who's so loyal and committed to you and trustworthy where can you get that in this world today <laughs> it's a very valuable thing so um, I would say those are some of the benefits of a long term relationship. Are there any absolute no's, you know, absolute complete no no's that you have seen um that you know for a fact you would advise even your own children to completely do away with for a happier marriage? One uh thing that I have learned is you know uh I never give lift to a woman for a man in a car. <laughs> Don. <laughs> yeah. Okay, on the on the bike then? <laughs> no. No. My principle was that, you know, I was working in an organization where there a lot of ladies working etc etc traveling and all that and I had a car. So people would say save money for the organization by taking other ladies when they are transferred here Carpooling. and there, you know, carpooling, you know. I said no. Because uh the travel time is 12 hours etc and i land up late at night at my place and then two ladies get down from my car at night 12 o'clock you know and there is some observer say hey news comes to i didn't innocently news comes to her that dawn from dawn's car two lady got down at 12 o'clock you know near that bridge over there she'll doubt me so i said never must a man give a lift to the opposite sex uh, <laughs> when he is alone in the car if my wife is there any many and when he is a handsome man <laughs> <laughs> so that is one aspect which i felt i will tell my children also never violate that because it betrays their trust however innocent one must be the other person will always doubt also karishma this situation actually what it admits is that we are vulnerable and we are frail human beings open yeah. to temptation we may try to defend ourselves and say no i'll never do that i made up my mind and all the rest of it but temptation is there all around you i know that there was a guy in um, there's some guy when i counsel we always make sure that whoever it is a guy or a girl and i'm talking to them that don is sitting there so that this is my safeguard and the other way around sometimes there's a guy who is has probably got good relationship with his mother and sisters he only sees me he doesn't even see that don exists he'll come up to me and he will talk and chat and everything and ignore him completely sometimes the opposite happens there's a certain attraction in an in a handsome man a flyer the glamorous fellow so he used to have a lot of people admiring him <laughs> i would look at him across the room and smile and he wouldn't know now <laughs> <laughs> no i'll tell you because i was flying in aircraft okay which flies at 40 kilometers a minute can you imagine in two and a half minutes i'll be in abu dhabi so far so obviously you know people will look at me <laughs> you will have this crowd of adoring She's females standing next to me <laughs> no no okay uh, what you've told me okay um if someone were to have this conversation with me at uh, you know a, i'm 39 another you know 39 40 year old and me having this conversation and immediately it would perk their eyebrows and it'd be like oh you don't trust your partner you don't uh, trust them to drop someone what if that someone has an emergency and needs a ride home you don't trust your partner with anyone in the middle of the night that says more about you than it does about your partner i think he is drawing a boundary for himself right it's not something you asked of him oh i didn't no. ask him and i wouldn't suspect him either <laughs> no, on the other hand krishna there is no harm in giving lift to the person of the opposite sex but the question is it should not come to her through some other source i've done it innocently i keep quiet about it someone else notices and she says 
How come my husband has not told me that? Whereas if you give a lift in an emergency, come and share that with us. Say that, look, last night this happened and there was an immediate requirement for me to take somebody along with me. I took. It's okay. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, when things like this, I've gone on a tour, you know, 12 hours away, I'm this thing, and I'm coming back now at night and things like that. So gossip travels. And if somebody has something against me, then they'll spice it up and say, right. you know, uh, yeah. so yeah. right. that should not happen. So I must be uh, uh, protecting myself in, for our relationship mm -hmm. to be prevented from things like this happening. That is the limit I lay down for myself. And I also think it, it teaches uh, the fact that it's humility, actually. You know where you know I learned this from? Huh? Huh? Billy Graham. Ah. Read about Billy Graham. He'll tell you how to travel. As a married man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anita, you were saying. It's also a certain humility in admitting that I'm, free, you know, I'm open to making mistakes. I can be tempted. And uh, that's a reality. It's not a sexual temptation. is a reality. Let's face it. And uh, to pretend it's not there... And when I was married, my mother was so wise. She said this to me. She said, you're getting married to this handsome guy and you're on top of the world. Everything's good. Remember, age is no bar and neither is marriage. <laughs> you know, she told me. And I said, Mama, how can you say that on my wedding day? But she, it, it proved true. It works both ways. There's definitely finances that I think would be a major factor in most conversations around relationships. And then I think another one, uh, tell me about insecurities. Does that come up often? Yes. When you talk about maturity, then uh, definitely insecurity, maturing to feel secure, to trust the other person is a process. And as a counselor, often you are just walking alongside the person, encouraging them to grow to a different level of trust, a different level of um, being able to uh, you know, of maturity in character of, in, uh, you know, dealing with their own insecurities, which may have nothing to do with their partner, but they, it can inhibit. So finance, insecurities are very important. Therefore, the way we see ourselves, the way we prepare ourselves for a long-term relationship is very important. How do we prepare ourselves for long-term relationships? The basic thing is I to we, trust and uh, Exercising the spirit of trust. Okay. Normally, there is a spirit of doubt in people. I meet you. You know, even in a church, if she goes, she says, look after my bag. And she's going to the toilet in the church. Look the bag, look after. <laughs> Who will take it? There is the spirit of doubt. That spirit of doubt must be removed because I believe that, yes, temptations are there, whatever it is, but I trust her completely. And if she betrays me, it's her problem, not my problem. She's answerable to the Almighty, not I. Okay. Yeah. So trust, you, you build up trust by trusting people. The trust is a choice, you know. Mm. And uh, if you don't trust somebody, you are the loser. But at the same time, there has to be a, a boundary. There has to be a protective boundary so that your trust is not betrayed. That was what I was going to ask you next is as... In that relationship, you know, what can the partner do to help? Well, uh, there's only one thing that overcomes insecurity. That is love and ongoing attention and love in spite of insecurity. You know, accepting that this person is insecure, accepting that that is maybe because of their background, maybe because of their thinking, maybe because he's a handsome man and other girls are looking at him. <laughs> we don't know. But uh, to accept. Uh, to be able to love and express that love and appreciation. Because one of the things we do with the couples is uh, if they are having a problem and we uh, have the session and after the session we send them home and say, okay, this week your homework is that you will uh, look at your partner and find something to appreciate every day of the week. Because it's so easy to pick faults, you know. So f for insecurity, you need somebody who loves and trusts you overwhelmingly more than you deserve. And then as the insecurity is beginning to be shed, then the responsiveness comes. It takes time. It takes time. But I'm sure I've experienced that. That the more you trust people, the more trustworthy they become. We 
have some preparation, you know, some pre-marriage uh, sessions with uh, kids. We had one with a person who's a Chinese mm -hmm. from Malaysia, and she's marrying a Chinese from Taiwan in Australia. Ooh. On Zoom, we had uh, six sessions. So finance is one of the things that expectations is a major thing. What is your expectation of this relationship? Right. What is your expectation of this relationship? Written separately, matched, mm -hmm. and finding it mismatched. Then we talk about it and take it up. So like that, there's some areas which they look at. Prioritizing. Yeah. I'll give you another example. Yeah. We were in a mission and uh, we had a group of uh, mission people, I mean foreigners coming and I was responsible to look after them and take them on a tour to Mysore and things like that. I was riding high, okay. The day of departure, 40 people ready there in the guest house. And uh, we were supposed to go together because she was supposed to look after the ladies, I was supposed to look after the men. She refused to come. She said, you are a monster. I know, I'm... You know, no, no. Let me put, the, put it right, that we had had a disagreement. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> that explains it. I'm considering myself, you know, I'm doing good work and this is my responsibility and, you know, etc., etc. And here... She refuses to come, you know. I said, what nonsense? I said, okay. I informed them that there's a problem. I'll come later on. I sat down with her and we discussed. And she came out and I said, okay, I'm sorry. This is what has happened. So we'll rectify it. So I gave her preeminence over the foreigners who had come and the plan that I had for my career. You see, the thing is that Trust must develop that I care for her. I may have moved and ignored her for some time. I do not know <laughs> whatever the reason may have been. The thing is to realize it and accept that I am wrong. I need to correct. I need to hear, give a listening ear and respond accordingly. So the trust, once again, it's trust that builds up and then we become one. Mm -hmm. Okay, we become one. There is no barrier there. It's wonderful when there's trust because you can be vulnerable. You can say, look, I'm a mess and it's all right. It certainly is. You mentioned that, you know, you talked and she forgave. I think forgiveness and unforgiveness is another thing that... Uh, Karishma. Yes. First 14 years of our marriage, 50 years we've been married, first 14 years, it was only I all the time saying sorry, sorry, sorry. Because he was always wrong. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that my learning, my faith is I need to take the leadership and demonstrate. It is my responsibility because according to me, <laughs> I'm supposed to present her blameless, <laughs> you know. So it's a big responsibility. Marriage is something very sacred to me. The moment the one who takes the initiative to rectify is blessed. So being the first one to say sorry doesn't necessarily mean that you're the weaker one in the relationship. You, you hit the nail on the head. Help her to understand that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. this, the, the person with more courage is the one who forgives. Yes. Isn't it? Forgiveness definitely is a, is a tough one. Uh, I know from personal experience, it's, um, it's very important to understand that, you know, I'm, for me, I'm able to tell Chandran that, you know, I, I have heard what you have had, you've, you've said, but I'm not ready to let go of this just yet. But then to work from that point on to come to that place where you are willing to let go and actually let go fully, wholly is... Uh, it's a process, um, Karishma, that you say, how can I forgive? And the emotions are all in turmoil. Then you come to a place where you will to forgive. I, I make an intentional decision to forgive. But the emotions are unruly. They don't fall in line, you know. So as you go on with that and, and, and persevere, you come to a place where your emotions settle down, you know. And that when you are reminded of that event, that emotional upheaval is no longer there. It's mm -hmm. like a wound with a scab. It's got yeah. no feeling left. Yeah, That's where you've really forgiven. So that whole process... You have to carry on. And it's great that you tell uh, Chandran that, you know, I'm not ready for it yet. That's honest. It's not great for him. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's being honest. Yeah. And as you walk through the process once, he will give you the space you need next time. <laughs> Chandran really is an amazing man. And uh, I learned so much from him. 
second time around marriage is just it's it's very very different it's uh your this is but i also feel like whether it's the first or second or whatever no one ever prepares you for marriage period my father used to say beta shaadi karoge to pachtaoge na karoge to bhi pachtaoge to kar ke pachtao what a wise man so the fruit hasn't fallen far from the tree <laughs> marriage is something beautiful it depends upon how you make it it's like building a house every brick has to have a cement okay and yet cracks develop and those cracks have to be corrected through forgiveness look who has got gray hair <laughs> between the two of us is <laughs> i'm getting there also <laughs> yeah i will say about our relationship that we were married for 7 years each going our own way we would not have lasted but at that time we came to know god and to trust him with our lives both of us together <laughs> Okay, hold it. <laughs> and what happened is, you come under a common government that's outside yourself. So there are rules, there are structures which are not mine or his, because I will oppose his structure. He will oppose my structure, and then it becomes easier to become we hmm. quicker. And that I would say was the, is the root of the success of our relationship today, that we are under a common government. that is not me or him that is god who gives us the ability to trust the ability to forgive but is it that you find um don is something that comes up a lot in these counseling sessions about relationships uh the men that you talk to the husbands the main problem is ego their own or their partners either side there is ego present there but is it the man saying that you know my i'm dealing with an egoistic spouse or is it that you noticed that there's ego present there is ego in present in in the, that's human uh, this thing yeah. the point is who should we follow there has to be a base plumb line that both of us if she says something i say show it to me from for us is the bible if it's not in the bible i don't believe what you're saying oh, my dad did this my mother did this that's different she comes with a particular background i come with now when two people come together they come from different backgrounds nowadays a lot of inter caste marriage this that and the other taking place so who should one believe to okay you decide between the two of you all what are you going to believe then it's okay because you have a plumb line many many couples don't have a plumb line they are on their own because of the baggage they bring from their family the baggage they bring from their family that baggage is carried into it there are many things that are unresolved between husband and wife the expectations are there meri bibi aise karegi kyunki meri maa aise karegi expectations is a major thing for premarital and baggage that has to be sorted because we are bringing our family culture our experience into the relationship which is totally different from the person and charisma one important factor is that we are role models to our children our children pick up things my god the way they pick up one has to see that that we are good role models to our children yeah. at whatever cost it may be and that is where our ego has to be kept down yeah. for the sake of the next generation today's generation is you know bad no why would you say that they don't respect elders we have to be role models to our children teach them and home is the place where you know character is made the other thing is that um someone with uh, abuse in their past i would say that they need to work through it very carefully before they come into a relationship otherwise it's very damaging so um and you'll be surprised how many come into a relationship with abuse which hasn't been dealt with you have to sit down and deal with it be willing to stand with that person till they deal with it and come out of come out of it yeah i feel like currently the way that life is just uh in dubai for example you know it just feels like the pace of things is insane everyone is on the move all the time and everyone wants to do the next thing and get to the next destination and uh plan the next event um it feels like you know today the villains of a relationship and the marriage are not necessarily outside of a marriage but life itself is seemingly now not conducive because the stress is so much 
the unhappiness from other events is so much and you're just not sitting down to cope from anything. There's no healing from anything. And all of it finally, I think, just, you know, boils over at home. What would you be able to share, if any, tools to deal with this? What you're saying is pressure happens, stress happens. But you haven't got the space and the time to deal with it. That's it. So it's piled up, piled up, piled up till you explode. There needs to be spaces in your togetherness also or in your busy schedule also. I know that it's an unrealistic thing to say when uh, work times goes, goes on till 9, 10 in the night, sometimes even later. But for your own mental health and the health of your relationship, you need to make those spaces. So it's holidays. It's weekends. You can put a boundary around that and say, I will not be available at this time. And it may, you may do nothing, but if you reflect on what is stressing you, you're actually dealing with it. Otherwise, you're just letting it pile up. And today's lifestyle is a very stressful, as you say. I'm, I was talking to a group of teachers in school. The rate of change of information is so fast that kids are not able to process this. It's just information to them, you know. And they haven't uh, understood significance, brought it into their life experience. It's just information and knowledge they may have gained. So, yeah, we ha it's, a, it's a stressful time for everybody, but particularly for a marriage. I was commanding a station and my adjutant would come and say, Sir, uh, so-and-so wants to visit you because that's the protocol. You visit senior officers, etc. So, okay, give it. So about once again, week, 10 days went by, people would come home, she would prepare some snacks for them, you sit down, have a drink and all that thing. Two weeks later, again, the, you know, bomb burst in the house. <laughs> said, what happened? She said, you don't have time for me, I'm not going to do this for you, you go do your own uh, this, that and the other. So I said, okay, I called my adjutant, I said, look, a Tuesday evening, no visitors. And I would spend time with her. The word went around, Tuesday evening, old man is having time with his own wife. I said, doesn't matter <laughs> what they are saying. But the question is, do I have priority for my family? Six days shall thou work, seventh day thou shall rest. The guideline is that. Yeah. Today's guideline is money, 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 make money, Sunday, this, that, and the other. I said, no, stop, out. stop mm -hmm. it, stop life. And nothing is going to happen. It's an anxious generation. Yeah that is afraid, you know, of missing out. I mean, unless you take that time off, because for mental health and for your own personality, you need the processing time. If you don't have it, you're damaging yourself terribly. You may, uh, you know, accumulate stuff in the bank, but you're damaging yourself. So that is, uh, if there is a place where these kind of um, principles are taught, outside of counseling, because counseling is someone who's already in distress and they're coming. But if there is an informal place where we can discuss and talk and think, yes, you're right that you are so stressed out because of work. How do we make space? Let's think together. Another thing I tell couples, those who have faith, belief, whatever it is, do you pray together? And quite often I just tell Antha, let's just worship Lord, you know, nothing to go to God for, I'm in this trouble, help me, nothing on that, just to be with the Almighty. And then you hear his voice say, hey man, I have this plan for you. Oh, thank you. And you know, then you're on the right path. Many times we tend to forget that. Do you have any offhand tips uh, for someone to try out the next time that things are falling apart? That's one of the premarital areas that we look at. But the thing is, communication isn't speaking only. Mm. It's listening. The first reaction of couples when there is a problem you switch off mm. because you are hurt. That is another area in which you must learn to overcome and say, I am hurting. Take the blame on yourself. Say, look, whatever has happened has happened, but I am hurting. I need to resolve this. I think one of my biggest problems is I go silent. I, I give Chandran that horrible silent treatment. It's worse. Uh, yeah. The thing is that the relationship is broken. There's a barrier that comes up. That barrier has to be overcome. What you're actually saying or conveying through your action is, I'm hurt mm. and I want space. But why not say it? What I'm thinking in my head at the time is that, you know, I have nothing nice to say right now, so I'll 
keep going circle back <laughs> to this conversation later but i think it just comes across as me being unwilling to participate in resolution whoever takes the first step to reconcile is blessed whatever the situation you know why shouldn't i take the first step no you know i am ready to forgive you come and no you demonstrate you be the role model acha aise karna ha beta chalo sometimes we need our space you know and you're not uh, yeah. without giving a, a shun to feeling to the other person you have to create that space and build the understanding with each other that look when i'm sometimes i just need time out i say that to don i say that you know i'm going from this room not because i'm rejecting you but i don't want to discuss this right now i want to process it so that it doesn't come out wrong i'm curious uh, you coming up on your 50th anniversary you still fight all the time <laughs> i told you we're too strong character i do not know why women can't think like men it would be so simple But now you know where the problem is i'm going to ask god why did he make me man the other why? thing is to get the guy to talk <laughs> he doesn't talk sometimes when he's upset what would you say is something that is your one you know um word of caution or advice to all women and then don from you to all the men i think respect i would say show respect to your partner and uh, a lot of things get resolved resolved in that i would say that would be the the one thing from my side i would say demonstrate shoulder the responsibility to demonstrate and uh, you will succeed demonstrate anything in whatever particular or whatever it may be whatever it may be you should be the first person to show how it is to be done you know you we talk a lot can i do a little game with you sure okay uh you do what i say okay put your right hand out okay put your right hand on your head put your right hand on your forehead put your right hand out put your right hand on your head put your right hand on your nose put your right hand out put your right hand on your put your right hand on your cheek you did it because you yeah. didn't say chin <laughs> 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 I knew you would do, do that because this is something that people do and 90% of the people put the hand they don't hear what I am saying okay so the point is people follow you rather than hear you okay so my this thing is you know like I told my son when he was 6 uh, years old my younger one and i had gone out for a walk i was still in the air force and i came back from my walk and i said beta bring papa's chappals you know what he said he said you go and bring my chappal <laughs> i went and brought it there after every time i would ask for my chappals he would bring it so they want to see us doing things so that is my word from a man when you want somebody to do something for you demonstrate That's very very unique. I have not heard anyone say that. Um so that's very interesting. You know, your experience in the uh Air Force. Um I know that you've done some pretty stellar uh events you've been part of. I've heard from Chandran. Um can I ask you what's something that is a memory you carry from your time in the Air Force? War hadn't started. The Pakistan Army was fighting against the Mukti Bahini. which was the bangladesh you know civilian army and india was helping the mukti bahini pakistan air force was coming and using their air force to help the pakistan army to destroy the mukti bahini and indian army was there in civilian clothes helping the mukti bahini to fight the pakistan army and the indian army was saying where is the indian air force and uh, the government hadn't given clearance for air force to go and attack because uh, war hadn't taken place one fine day we got an order to go and intercept the pakistani aircraft that had come and were attacking the post over there that place was called boira at boira there was our artillery they were helping the mukti bahini against the pakistan army we went over there we were four aircraft air defense role that means we were defending our air space and we were told that pakistan air force has entered indian air space so go and protect that so we went over there and in that aerial battle okay uh, three pakistani saber aircraft had come we were four nats so we got involved in aerial battle 
and I happened to shoot down one Pakistani aircraft. The pilot ejected. He was caught. There was another aircraft that was shot down by another member of our, our formation. The pilot ejected. He was also caught. These two were prisoners of war in India. They were with us for more than a year or so. After that, uh, war stopped and all that. They went back. I continued in the Air Force. That gentleman continued in the Air Force and things went on. And finally, I took early retirement and I was now working in a mission in Kunur. And uh, in 1990, somewhere, I was reading the newspaper and I read that so-and-so has become the new chief of air staff of Pakistan. And that was the chap that I had shot down. Mm-hmm. Okay, same name, Parvez Mehendi Qureshi. So, I wrote a letter to him saying that congratulations and Sometimes in life our paths had crossed. Okay, I sent it to him. A week, ten days later, I got a letter from Pakistan. The um, staff officer to the chief of air staff, he wrote a reply to me saying that chief of air staff has received your letter and he acknowledges it. Thank you very much and all that. But I was disappointed that I written to the chief. A week later, I got a blue envelope Pakistani stamps on it, etc., and a blue paper. And Chief of Air Staff, Parvez Mehindi Qureshi, dear Group Captain Lazarus, and congratulations for your, thank you for your, you know, words of congratulations to me, etc., etc. And it's good that you're doing good service for the nation, you know. That's it. I still got that letter. And that is about uh, 30 years ago. I've got that envelope and this thing. So, we, as Aviators, professionals, professionals Mm -hmm. do recognize each other. We are not at war with anybody. We were doing our duty. He did his duty. I did my duty. He rose up. I rose up. This, that, and the other. So that is what happened in the Bangladesh war. After the incident, uh, the then president, Yahya Khan, he said, we will go to war and war started. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Anita, for coming on the show, for just opening up and sharing all this uh, love with us. And, uh, you know, I know for a fact that uh, the one thing really above all others is is that love, Um, you know, and when you shower that in a relationship, it'll take you through many, many seasons. Of course, uh, sometimes I wonder if I'm the same person when I'm in a situation not showing love. But uh, either way, thank you for the, uh, you know, just for the insight that you've shared today. And we'll see you once again on the next episode of Hey Karish.